Cinema Jaw is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. And we thank them for their support. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from our respective homes in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rye the Movie Guy, and this week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we get ready for the fall movie season with our fall movie preview, and it's a difficult one to do this year. It is. It is. I mean... Everybody knows why. We don't have to go into why it's a difficult one. But, man, I'm usually so excited this time of year. I'm ready for Halloween. I'm ready for picking apples. I'm ready for all the fun things you can do in the fall. And this year, I'm just ready for it to be over already. I think everyone's in that boat. Yeah, and when it comes to movies, it is difficult to actually get excited for a movie because we don't know if that particular movie is actually going to come out. So what we did, Jawheads, is this. With our fall movie preview, we each picked five movies, three of which we know are coming out because they've been announced either on a streaming service or they're going to be video on demand. Right. And then two of the picks can be what we're calling hopefuls. These are films that, as of right now, have a release date by the end of this calendar year. If it happens, nobody's really sure right now but we'll go over some films that we're looking forward to. Yeah, and not to be too much of a downer, man. I think we started this off on the down. Movies, this is exactly what we need right now, is some good movies to look forward to to help us escape a little bit. I agree. Uh, It's always exciting to to talk about the big movies of the fall and also exciting, Matt. Wow, we got a great guest who's going to be joining us this week. That's right. A Chicago legend. He is a writer, an artist, an actor. Tony Fitzpatrick is joining us today. I have been wanting Tony Fitzpatrick to come on Cinema Jaw for years. Some of his screen credits include Primal Fear, Philadelphia, Chirac. If you're a fan of the Amazon show Patriot, uh, he had a reoccurring role on that. He's really a jack of all trades. And his new film is entitled Dreaming Grand Avenue. And Matt and I both saw this film And it's a complex little indie film, isn't it, Matt? It is. You know, I was thinking about this a little bit, Ryan. It's like we watch all these, um, you know, mainstream films, hopefully to build up a bit of trust. And, you know, obviously we enjoy those films as well. But something unusual, something different comes along, like Dreaming Grand Avenue, that we can recommend it and hopefully increase its audience because it's very worthy. It is. In the movie, Tony Fitzpatrick plays a detective, and we'll talk to him about this, but he plays a detective in the dream world. So he's a dream detective, right? Pretty interesting. And these two people who have not met in real life meet for the very first time in each other's dreams. I can't wait to talk about it because it is a film that's, like I said, a little bit unusual, off the beaten path. You think it's going one way and then it turns and goes another way. There's a little bit of horror in it, a little bit of uh, romance in it, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of drama, and a lot of Chicago. Agree. So we will be talking to Tony Fitzpatrick. And in honor of Dreaming Grand Avenue, we're going to ask Tony to take you on in dream movie trivia. How's that sound, Matt? Sounds like a nightmare. (laughs) Besides that, we have two big reviews for the Jawheads. That's right, Ryan. We are reviewing Antebellum and The Social Dilemma, new Netflix documentary. This is unbelievable. This jaw is packed. It is jam-packed. Yep. It is also Robert Pattinson month. We continue celebrating Robert Pattinson with this fact. Cosmopolis, Ryan, was Robert Pattinson's first film he worked on after finishing the last Twilight sequel. He stated that the experience of working with David Cronenberg and having the film premiere at Cannes made him realize that he could pursue independent projects helmed by auteur directors. Before that, he didn't think he was good or worthy enough to act in auteur cinema. Hmm. It takes working with David Cronenberg, right? 
well, that'll do it. But I mean, I, I understand why Pattinson felt that way. And I, I think a lot of us felt that way about Robert Pattinson. You know, we've talked about this during this month long celebration of him that, that he sort of had to redeem himself somewhat after the, the teeny bopper YA Twilight movies, which were largely poorly received by the adults. Right. And I, I do think that it's a case of, of somebody sort of testing his talent. Twilight isn't all that aggressive of a film, right? Right. So all of a sudden he goes a totally different direction and starts working with these tour directors like a David Cronenberg. And I didn't really care for Cosmopolis. I thought it was slow moving. I couldn't get into it, uh, just not on my, my level. But I know there are fans of it. But since then, Robert Pattinson made some really good choices and worked with some great directors. That's right. He's not just Cedric Diggory anymore. Absolutely not. All right, Matt, we ready to get the show on the road? You bet, man. Without further ado, we bring in our guest. Tony Fitzpatrick is a Chicago-based artist, and by artist, I mean multimedia collages, paintings, drawings, written books. He has acted on stage, on television, on the big screen. His latest film is Dreaming Grand Avenue. Tony Fitzpatrick, welcome to Cinema Jaw. Man, thanks for having me. As my resume states, I'll do anything to avoid honest work. <laughs> Enjoy. How are you guys doing? Good, man. I mean, you know, living, living the dream in this crazy time we're having, but, you know, I'm glad even yeah. though we can't be in studio, we can get together with great people on, on Zoom and do a podcast still. Where, where do you guys usually record from? I mean, where is your home studio? Our home studio is at Cards Against Humanity. It's on Elston. It's like Elston. Oh, wow, and- man. I've, I've played that game with my kids. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, well, fun. their offices are here, and they got a yeah. great studio. It is fun. Yeah, there are things that come up in Cards Against Humanity that I, I never wanted my children to know. But, uh, <laughs> man, it's a fun game, you know? It sure is. It is. Uh, Tony, before we get to dreaming of Grand mm-hmm. Avenue, as I was reading the resume, and, and we talked about it at the top of the show, you really are sort of a jack of all trades when it comes to the arts. What do you tell people when you meet somebody? You just say, I'm an artist, or or which way do you lean to describe what exactly you do? Well, I mean, the first thing that I became kind of noted for was uh, visual art. But, you know, I look at the resume, and I think it's, it's a body of work, and I think it's all part of the same thing. You know, I very often have interviewers say, are you an artist who acts and writes or are you an actor who writes and makes art? And I don't so much distinguish. Uh, I go to my studio every day or I go to a film set every day and the the goal remains the same. It's like I'm, I'm there to make art. However that manifests itself, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I came to know who Tony Fitzpatrick was at a time I was going to Steppenwolf quite a bit. I was going to see a lot of plays at the time. And I saw that there was this one man show called This Train. Yeah. And I went and I saw it and I was worried because I had never seen just a, a one man show at that point. And I was totally blown away and couldn't believe it. And it, it's such an interesting, well, yeah, it's such an interesting play. So if you could tell the audience how you came to the idea of this train and what it's about. I think that gives a, you know, it a was, good understanding. It was, it was loosely based on the hobo alphabet, which is a lost language. It was a language that people who were not literate understood. They were idiomatic little diagrams that the hobos used to communicate with each other. One of the things I've always loved about the American promise and spirit is that People who had nothing always found a way, and it was usually creative. Yeah, it was awesome. I thought it was a perfect way to to kind of marry the idea of uh, my visual art and the things I was writing. Hey, Tony, have have you ever seen a movie called Borgman? No, it's it's a European thing, right? You're it about is. the fifth person to ask me about it. The reason I bring it up is because part of the story delves into the hobo alphabet and i don't know oh, i don't in europe you should watch what, what, it what's odd is that the american hobo alphabet and the european hobo alphabet are damn near identical 
And it, you know, this, yeah. this was a, a group of symbols cobbled together by people who really don't have a narrative tradition, people who are not able to read and write. I mean, th these were kind of the lessons I learned from Stead Circle. Yeah. It was uh, just invaluable in shaping the way that I saw the world and the way that I made art. A quick question again before we get to Dreaming Grand Avenue. You were in Chirac, which was shot yeah. here in Chicago, yeah. directed by Spike Lee. Do you audition for Spike Lee? How does that come out that you get into Chirac? You know what? It's the funniest thing because um, John Cusack had showed Spike a bunch of columns I wrote about Rahm Emanuel. And Spike like laughed his ass off and just tossed off the comment, it's a damn shame this guy's not an actor. And Johnny said, you know, actually he is. And Spike looked at him and said, I want him up here in an hour. At the time, I'd been recovering from heart surgery. I'd had a quadruple bypass, and I, was, I still had a brace on my leg from, you know, they harvested a big vein from my calf to fix my heart with. And um, I didn't want to go in there like uh, gimping around. So I ditched my cane and, and the brace. And I went in there, and I brought Spike a book. And we sat down and we talked for a half an hour, you know, and um, I tried to convert him over to the bulls. They're not going to happen. You know? <laughs> you know? I mean, he is he's so thoroughly a Knicks fan. It's just, it's, you know, but um, he said to me, he said, you know, uh, you're either going to be the chief of police or you're going to be the mayor. Uh, I said, Spike, do you want me to read or anything? Goes, no, 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 no. Just, you just, Blame me. You're in it, you know, and I think he has an instinct. I think he'd seen a little bit of my tape. I think he has an instinct about people, you know, I mean, wonderful conversation. And honest to God, he's without a doubt, one of the best guys I ever worked for in my life. That's awesome. And the experience of Chirac shooting that down in, uh, in Auburn Gresham and in Englewood and stuff, it, it was very controversial, and I mean largely because uh, Rahm Emanuel did not like the title, and he said to Spike, well, I think you maybe you should change that. Spike said, well, why should I? This title came from rappers uh, from Chicago. I'm, I'm not going to change it. You know, kind of the face-off was on. And this is before Spike had uh, Amazon agree to sign on to uh, Amazon – released Chirac as their first movie as mm -hmm. a movie studio. You know, I recovered from heart surgery and, and Spike said, look, anything I need to do to make sure you're comfortable in your I had to have an assistant on set, a, a young man who worked for me, who's now a, uh, a Chicago policeman, a young man named Kerry Ferentella. And you know what? They, it was 95, 98 degrees every day. And Spike had an outdoor air conditioning unit brought in to take care of me and uh, made sure I had a chair between takes. I mean, just could not have been a better human being. I just uh, Great I absolutely love the man. Um, yeah. And I love his movies. And I have since 1989. You know? As do we. Yeah, As do we. And yeah. speak, speaking of great movies, uh, this latest feature, Dreaming Grand Avenue, uh, yeah. we, see a, we see a lot of smaller independent films, but most of them are not as in depth and complicated of a story as this Absolutely. one. Absolutely, you, you, you play know, a, a, a dream it. detective. Uh, Absolutely, you know what? I mean, when, I got to, when I got to the script, I thought I've never seen this before. I I have no earthly clue how he did it. And what I love about Dreaming Grand Avenue is it's unlike anything else out there. You know, it's uh, it it's is. only like itself. And I, I tend to think that he very stealthily made an art film. And, um, you know, I mean, it certainly will not be for everybody, right? But uh, I think he touched all the bases, you know. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of stuff about the dream state, uh, Joseph Campbell and myth and stuff like that. Hugh really paid attention, and and he got the right actors. He got, you know, Jackson Rathbone and the, the lovely young woman from Narcos, Troy West, uh, Wendy Roby, um, 
I could not have been happier to, than to be in that company. And I've never had as much to do on screen. I mean, until Patriot, my screen career consisted of, okay, you come in, you hit the guy with a board, or you get hit with a board. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, look at this face. I mean, I'm not a leading man. I'm not ever going to get the girl. I'm never going to have an on-screen kiss. It's like, you can only dress a side of beef up so much, you know? And um, <laughs> Dreaming Grand Avenue let me do a role that was a meditation, as did Patriot, you know. And um, it's really odd at this stage of my career as an actor that uh, they finally let me act, yeah. you know. Um, the same with Stephen Conrad for, for Patriot. Sure. Um, and by the way, the, how it was shot, Chris Rohano is uh you know the most valuable player of that whole thing because Hugh wanted like a dream state and Chris absolutely gave it to him and and the great Troy West who plays uh, Walt Whitman oh I love Walt that was awesome Walt Whitman. Um, in the green belt come on absolutely <laughs> it's fantastic absolutely I like when he comes up and tells me Battling mendacity and indifference, and it's and Jack Cancy tells him, "Oh, the main, the mendacious, the pukes are everywhere." I just thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, I love that it was so much a Chicago film. You yeah, know, really I looked was. around, I saw actors that I admired for years, all kind of present. I looked behind the camera, and there were women, and there were a bunch of people. It was the most diverse crew I ever saw in my life. And I thought, man, you know what? It's changing, and it's changing for the better. That's good to hear, man. Very good to hear. Yeah. You, Amen. You, you had mentioned that you, you got to make them laugh or they're going to kill you. And Dreaming Absolutely. Grand Avenue, for the most part, is a complicated kind of story. You got to follow along. But you supplied some good humor. You got some funny lines in there. Well, you know, I'm a funny guy, you know. <laughs> It didn't hurt. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of intrigue. You know, my son is also in this movie. He plays the policeman. It's the first time we've ever been in the same thing together. He was on, you know, Chicago PD and he just, he, he worked on a, uh, on a pilot called, uh, the gray market, which is not out yet. It'll be out pretty soon. And, uh, he's a marvelous actor. He's got 10 times more talent than I do, but, um, it was marvelous to play a, a role that was rooted in some old tropes, you know? I mean, Jack Yancey's a dream detective. He has a detective door, frosted glass, you know, the whole nine yards. And then, you know, when the young man walks through the door and we have this conversation, it's not like a detective uh, novel or, or movie. It's, it, it becomes... Uh, it becomes, a, in a very short order, a... Uh, uh, kind of otherworldly. So I, I was kind of edified by that. I was kind of edified that, that Hugh was willing to uh, break so completely with convention. It has a lot to say. Yeah. I mean, it, it dips its toe yeah. in, in horror. Uh, it's very poetic at times. Uh, even, even a bit of a social message. It's, it's doing a lot of things. I like that Hugh kind of went around culturally and try to include everyone. I mean, some people have said, well, he tried to include too much, but I, I tend to think the film kind of takes place in some dream states, and I'm okay with it. You know, I mean, I've, uh, I've not ever been in a film that was, is, is entirely kind of nonlinear, you know, but there is a thematic unity that, that connects all of it. So a marvelous experience, you know, I mean, I don't, want to be the kind of actor who goes to set and is the same old stuff every day. You know, um, you want to make sure that being an actor is like juggling with one ball. You got to keep finding a way to, you know, reinvent it. You know, uh, I was going to ask you, Tony, there, there's a scene early in the movie in dreaming grand Avenue where they're on the, the blue line uh, in the subway and the doors open. And instead of being uh, an L stop, you get this beautiful beach like scene. And I thought, boy, that's really strange. Tony, what's the weirdest thing that's happened to you on the L or the subway here in Chicago? Oh man. 
Okay, I'm gonna have to go through my top five. <laughs> uh, there was a guy who, who brought his bag, and every time it would stop, he'd open it up and he'd spit in it. And I thought, you know, maybe I should ask him why? Why are you laying hawkers into your bag? And then I thought, you know, better not to know. Um, and then uh, I was on the L one time and. Uh, Bernie Mac got up and started telling jokes. And I thought, wow. I don't know who, I don't know who he is, but he's very funny. At a certain point, I had to stop taking public transportation because I'm like a magnet for every disturbo that ever gets on the CTA. So I'm, I'm like an Uber guy now. You know, I mean, my <laughs> paintings sell, my paintings sell real well. I I get work in films. I um, you know, sure. I'm doing you, you earned it. Yeah. You earned it, Tony. And Tony, uh, we got a red carpet premiere taking place for Dream yeah. Avenue. It's great that we can do it at, at the drive-in, right? Absolutely, man. I, I had my first intimate experiences in a drive-in, and I got to tell you, it, it changed my world. And my voice dropped a few octaves that night. So it's, they're um, back, right? They're they're back in full force. <laughs> yeah. They're back, and you know what? I love them. I mean, one of my jobs uh, as a teenager was working at the uh, Sky High on Route 53 and North Avenue. Well, technically, it was in Addison. It was actually in Glen Ellen or Lombard. I love the drive-in. I mean, that's where, I, you know, me and Buzz, when we did drive-in reviews for The Loop, when you guys were merely children, from 1987 to 19, it was like, uh, in memory of all those movies we saw at the drive-in, you know, Death Race 2000, Deranged, Last House on the Left. Um, oh, you're speaking my Star language. I mean, uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, crazy man movies. I adore drive-ins. I, I hope they make, come back in a big way. I mean, maybe the only salient thing to come out of this whole mess of this pandemic is drive-ins are like a thing again. And I loved when they were part of the American landscape and part of the American experience. Dreaming Grand Avenue will be at the drive-in in Pilsen. Check it out if you're local jawheads. If not, follow online. It will be playing video on demand, Dreaming Grand Avenue. Do it, everybody. All right, we are going to hear from Tony Fitzpatrick. Later on in the show, he's going to take Matt on in Dream Movie Trivia. Before we get there, though, we got a review of Antebellum. Janelle Monet's career started off in music. In 2016, she made the move to the silver screen with two fantastic supporting roles in Moonlight and Hidden Figures. Earlier this year, she starred in the second season of the Amazon show Homecoming. Now she can be seen starring in the horror film Antebellum a dual timeline film, one in modern day and one in the antebellum south. You're from Virginia, right? I can tell. You're special. We are the future. You. You're not like the others. you were before ah! that's over antebellum opens with beautiful music playing while we see in slow motion the horrors of slave life on a plantation in the deep south the contrast is very unsettling we meet one of the slaves played by janelle monet and come to find out that a plan to escape had been thwarted. This is a reform plantation filled with Confederate soldiers back from the front lines of the Civil War. The atmosphere created is full of dread and fright. Slavery on its own is scary, but directors Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz are able to give it a chilling horror vibe at the same time. We stay in this timeline for 40 minutes and the outlook is bleak. We then jump to modern day and meet Veronica, also played by Janelle Monet. 
She has her PhD, has written various books, and goes on television political shows. She is married and has a young daughter. Exhausted from work and being a mom, she plans a night out on her next business trip. Gabare Sidibe, best known for Precious, pops up as her friend. She tries her best to supply some humor in these scenes as three friends enjoy dinner out. It's at this time, however, Antebellum starts to play its horror hand. Someone sneaking into Veronica's hotel room. People from the past reimagined. All this leads to a big payoff. No spoilers here. The atmosphere I spoke of was the best thing about the film. That had me hopeful this was going to be something special. The acting by Monet is serviceable, and I should mention Jenna Malone appears in this as well and is excellent. But it's a film with a twist, and it is a twist that while it may shock people, it does not hold up the more you think about it. The marketing of this movie leads you to believe this is a scary film, but that's not the case either. Antebellum starts strong, but failed at its grand attempt. Mm, that's a shame, man. I was uh, actually pretty hopeful for this. Y you had compared it to an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Is, is that fair? Yeah, and I, I think we'll get to that when I, I give my movie poster quote. It definitely took heavy inspiration from M. Night or the idea of uh, having a big twist in there mixed with what we're seeing at least attempted at, at what Jordan Peele is doing with having a, a, a social commentary going on at the same time. Yeah. And, and it, it, it really didn't do that as well as it, it, it went for the twist. Well, so that's another thing I was going to ask because obviously um, there's this Jordan Peele sort of kicked off a new tone in horror stuff that we hadn't quite seen before with um, us and get out. And this seems like uh, a spiritual sequel in, in the Jordan Peele sort of, vein or camp, whatever you want to call it. And, and it doesn't get there. Is it that doesn't. right? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And and in fact, yeah, I would actually say that it, it partly like if the movie was going down the road and, and it hit a fork in the road and one of them said M. Night Shyamalan to the left and one said Jordan Peele, the, the movie would have started to split apart, but ultimately would have went with M. Night Road to the left. And, it, it, and not in a good way. Yeah, not in a good way. It abandoned the idea of trying to use the story for a much larger scope uh, on commentary on, on where we are as a society today. To be honest, a, a bit disappointing. You know, I've, I've always said horror is best when it, it says something. It, it seems like this movie really tries to say something, but, but doesn't quite cross that finish line. And I can also tell... You're dancing around some pretty major spoilers. Was the was the twist really that shocking? It, it's definitely sort of the point of the movie, you know. And I don't want to get into spoilers at all, so I don't want to necessarily say too much that might hint at things. But the story is based around the twist, and that, that's all I'll say on that. So it's it's sort of like that's the point of the movie is to get to the twist instead of the point of the movie actually making some type of social commentary. Um, you know, and you would leave the theater or thinking you know, something. Just, yeah. Yeah. In this case, you know, it's on video on demand, you know, walk out of your living room thinking something. The only thing you're really going to be talking about is does the twist make sense? Does the twist hold up with any type of analytical thought to it? From my point of view, I would say no. All right. Well, Jawheads, I haven't had a chance to see this yet. So Ryan, last question. Should I see this? Should I bother? You know, it's a middle of the rotor. I'm giving two jaws to Antebellum. I did really appreciate the first 40 minutes, that atmosphere. Again, always when you see slavery in movies, the, the horrors of it is, is present. But they also did accomplish bringing in a, a horror film vibe to that on top of just being on a plantation. Right. And, you know, and, and being slaves, there was also this this horror element involved in, in the... I like that. That's cool. How about a movie poster quote? You hinted I went, at it. Yeah, I went with M. Night fans will love it. Yeah. Well, hey, there there are several M. Night fans. Him, his mom. It's got to be a couple others. Two Jaws for Antebellum. It is playing video on demand and 
it leads us into our fall movie preview. And it was actually listed for publications that had done fall movie previews prior to Antebellum was one of the films a lot of people were looking forward to. Yeah. Again, not knowing exactly what is coming out, we are doing three for sure. And that's where we're going to start. Okay. Three movies that we are looking forward to that we know are going to be released on a streaming service or video on demand. All right. So here's my list, Ryan. This, these are in no particular order. So my first pick would be Hubie Halloween, which is scheduled to hit Netflix on October 7th. It is one of the films in Adam Sandler's Netflix. <laughs> it's, um, a, it's a Sandler movie? It's a, it's a Happy Madison production. And here's the thing. I am a Sandler fan. He's made some crappers, but sometimes even the crappers are kind of fun and silly and stupid. It's just like unplug your brain and watch some idiotic humor. This actually looks like he's, he's been on an upward trajectory lately. You know, of course we got uncut gems and then uh, he wasn't in the wrong Misty, but that's a happy Gilmore production or happy Madison. Anyway, this looks like it could be a really good horror comedy. It's definitely got that style. I love me Tucker and Dale versus evil. And it sort of feels like, another Tucker and Dale versus evil, but it's very much that Halloween Haddonfield, Illinois sort of vibe. They're in this like small town and there's a slasher or something. And he's the boy who cried wolf and has to convince the townsfolk. I'm on board. I saw the trailer. It looks good. Hubie Halloween. Interesting. I did not know that it was an Adam Sandler production. I saw the title pop up while I was uh, doing some research and I had no clue. Uh, For my first pick here, again, no order. This one comes out on Apple TV Plus. So hopefully people will have that. It is reuniting Bill Murray with Sofia Coppola. Obviously, they gave us the great Lost in Translation. They're reuniting for the film On the Rocks. Mm -hmm. And Bill Murray plays Rashida Jones's father. I, I hope they explain this because I don't think the two look anything alike how they're, they're father and daughter, but, and he's a larger than life father figure. And he's trying to figure out if his daughter's husband is cheating on her. And the two sort of launch into an investigation in the trailer. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, dude, honestly, uh, lifting the curtain here a little bit, it would have been on my list as well, but I know how big a fan you are of lost in translation. So had to give this one to Ryan, but uh, who wouldn't be? It's, it's A24, it's Bill Murray, reunited with Sof- uh, Sofia Coppola. Mm-hmm. Everyone's looking forward to this. This might be the, the one that people like us, like true film fans, are most excited about. Yep, it's going to open up one of the film festivals in New York at the beginning of October. Look for it late October on Apple TV+. Plus. I mean, that's almost reason to get Apple TV Plus alone maybe for just a month swings it back over to me. My next pick is a documentary that almost ties in with our second review later in the show called agents of chaos by Alex Gibney. And it takes a deep dive from all accounts. It is, it is not partisan, but we'll, we'll find out into the Russian interference in the 2016 election. So I, you know, we, we sort of need this documentary right now and it's coming out on HBO and HBO max on September 23rd. So, so yeah, just a couple of days from now. Another reason to get HBO. See, we got to have all these streaming. Services. I know it's too much, too much. <laughs> all right. For me, I go to Netflix, the big, the big Netflix on October 21st. I saw this trailer and it really got me pumped. The name of the film is Rebecca and it stars Lily James. Army Hammer, Kristen Scott Thomas, and it's directed by Ben Wheatley. Believe it or not, Jawheads, Ben Wheatley has appeared on Cinema Jaw when he was uh, promoting his film Free Fire. Got to do a phone interview with him. This is based on the 1938 novel, and there was actually an Alfred Hitchcock film based yeah. on that novel. Right. And it was uh, one of his first Hollywood films came out in 1940. So this is a remake of a Hitchcock, but I think it's, it's really going for the source material uh, and not necessarily like a straight up remake of the Hitchcock movie. 
And the story involves a young newlywed couple who arrives at the husband's imposing family estate on a windswept English coast. The wife finds herself battling the shadow of his first wife, Rebecca, whose legacy lives on in the house long after her death. If you watch the trailer, this is one slick looking movie. It's got some style to it. And I love a good thriller that has got the, the kind of style, the look that this Rebecca film has. I think this has major potential. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, man. He's, he's definitely, even Free Fire, which was kind of a, a bit of a romp, shall we say, displayed plenty of style. Mm -hmm. And you, you've got to have something if you're going to remake, even if it's not a straight remake, as you say, you've got to bring something to the table if you're touching a project that Hitchcock touched. Looking Absolutely. forward to that as well. That is October 21st on Netflix, Rebecca. My final pick for ones that we know for sure will be coming out stars Sasha Baron Cohen as Abby Hoffman. This is an Aaron Sorkin film, both written by and directed by, and it is about the Chicago 7. It's called The Trial of the Chicago 7. And the reason I'm looking forward to this, like I've heard of Abby Hoffman steal this book Eddie Redmayne is also in this. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It's got a fantastic cast. I don't know, really, I don't know the story of the Chicago 7 and, and what it's all about. So I'm really looking forward to learning something new, I suppose. Yeah, it's interesting because I am coming at it from another angle. And I've brought up this film called The Chicago 10, mm, which is yeah. actually about the Chicago 7 also. It's just that that... They called it the Chicago 10 because they included the lawyers who defended the Chicago 7. It was done with animation, and they actually used the court hearings, the actual audio from the court, and then they animated that in the movie. It's, it's fantastic, the Chicago 10. That's so a I'm documentary? Yeah. I mean, a documentary, but it, it's one of those like interesting – it's not a straight-up doc because it's got this animation going on, and that's called Chicago 10 – but that got me to realize what had exactly happened, at least the story of it. But I'm still looking forward to the trial of the Chicago 7. And I'm going to throw this in the jaw box. It, this may be Aaron Sorkin's directorial debut. I'm not positive if he's directed. I know he's written so many great films, but I'm yeah. going to throw that in. Yeah, well, I mean, naturally, one of the things that pops into mind is the social network and, and the, just the dialogue he creates in all his films so really looking forward to anything written by Sorkin. So. The one I saved for the last is, uh, could be, I guess, in some way, a little controversy here because it doesn't have a set date on a streaming service, but it is the film that is being uh, talked about quite a bit right now because it is premiered already at the Toronto International Film Festival, won the top prize at the Venice Film Festival, so I think at this point, it's going to come out because it has all the momentum. And if anything, at this point, mid-September, it's probably the front runner for Best Picture, Nomadland, which stars Francis McDormand and is directed by Chloe Zhao, who gave us The Rider, which was a small, intimate movie. And I remember being really wowed by The Rider. And then everybody started talking about this Nomadland and it's about a woman who embarks on a journey through the American West after losing everything during the recession. And I know our friend Brian Tallarico has now seen this as he had access to the Toronto International Film Festival screenings. And he said in a tweet, it's just so great that it lived up to everything we wanted it to. And Doing the research as it stands right now, I believe it's at 100% fresh on the tomato for the critics who have seen it. Wow. So I'm pumped. I'm excited. As, as much as I was upset that I was missing Toronto this year after being there last year, it was actually exciting to see tweets and buzz on Twitter for a film that I, I'm anticipating. So now I'm excited again about something this fall to check out. Currently, it is supposed to be released December 3rd. Did McDormand win for um, Three Billboards? She did. She got Oscar gold for that? Yes, that was her second win. She also won for Fargo, so she's a two-time winner. Heavens forbid we could see a three-time winner. Not, yeah. You never know. Or a best picture, you know? 
brings us to our hopefuls. Oh, and if I forgot to mention, October 16th for the trial of the Chicago 7, that's when it drops on Netflix. But now we are into the movies that have a theatrical release date on them currently, but obviously, who knows in 2020. Uh, and I'm going to get us started, Ryan, with one that should be absolutely no shock. I'm sure you won't be shocked by this pick. Black Widow. Oh, my goodness. Holy crap. Could I use a new Marvel movie? Please, please. You, you, you have the shakes from withdrawal. I do. I really do. I mean, I'm, I'm about to go down to the comic book store and just start buying back issues of something just to have something to hold me over. And, you know, it, it, it's like uh, when you start drinking the vanilla extract or something. Scarlett Johansson in this, and as well as a couple of other heavy hitters making their Marvel Cinematic Universe debut. Florence Pugh from Midsommar fame, and also David Harbour, who you may know from Stranger Things, Ryan. And this is the story of Black Widow. First of all, a superhero who's been around since pretty much the beginning of the MCU and should have had her own solo movie a long, long time ago. So it's about damn time, and it's late. It's really late. Like, the movie's been finished for a long time and I just got to see it. God damn it. Release date of that right now is November 6th in theaters. Mm. Fingers crossed. Fingers I, crossed. The thing that gets me the most excited about that movie and, and you mentioned her is Florence Pugh. Yes, she was great in Midsommar. She was great in Little Women. And if you get a chance to see the movie Fighting With My Family, which is a WWE produced film. Believe it or not, it's, it's actually pretty damn good. And she's in that as well. She can really do no wrong at this point. So I'm excited to see what she does in the MCU. Same. For my pick on a film, I hope that comes out right now. It's scheduled to come out on Christmas Day, December 25th. I'm going with a Tom Hanks film. You can't go wrong. Looking forward to a Tom Hanks movie during Oscar season. The name of the film is News of the World, and it's directed by Paul Greengrass, and it is about a Texan traveling across the Wild West, bringing the news of the world to local townspeople. He agrees to help rescue a young girl who was kidnapped. Enter Tom Hanks, and the result, one entertaining movie. So Tom Hanks is sort of like the wise old man figure in this? I believe so, but he's going to help rescue a girl. Sounds like true grit, kind of. I like Paul Greengrass. I like Tom Hanks. I haven't seen the trailer for this one yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it a spin and tell you what I think. Hopefully, it, we'll see it, like I said, right now, December 25th for in theaters. All right, another big, big movie that everyone's been waiting for. It's been pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Coming out, supposedly, November 20th in theaters, No Time to Die, the next James Bond movie. Could it be Daniel Craig's last James Bond movie? He's, he's said this before, so I don't know. But uh, as of now, he's claiming this to be his last one as well. So we'll see. And he's also starting to maybe show a little wear from the role. I'm a big Bond fan, man. And I've been looking forward to this one again since like last year. So please, November 20th, drop James Bond on us. It's always fun when a James Bond movie comes out. I'm not the biggest Bond fan. Definitely not even as big a Bond fan as you are. You seem to have seen many more of the uh, films than I have. But yet, Bond is sort of like a cinematic moment. It's something to be excited about when a new Bond movie comes out. And I have seen all of the Daniel Craig James Bond films in the theater. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one as well. No doubt. My number one is Dune. Oh, God, yeah. It's the most anticipated film I'm looking forward to. Uh, it has a release date of December 18th. We did talk about it in length just last week on Cinema Job when we all went gaga over the trailer that it dropped. But that is my number one pick. It's the, the film I'm most excited for. Denny Villeneuve does great work. And outside of probably Christopher Nolan, he's the director I look forward to the most of seeing what, what is going to to do next. So you, you have that on top of a, a very complex and interesting sci-fi story, which is right up my alley. And then the cast, as you've mentioned, half of Hollywood and Timothy Charlemagne, whose rising star is just going to get that much bigger. I think, I think we got the chance for something really special on our hands with Dune. A couple of others, Wonder Woman, 
we're, yeah. we're both hoping for and soul the yeah. pixar movie i know see that one doesn't make sense to me a couple of these like why not just go ahead uh, trolls world tour kind of showed what what video on demand can do for a family film why not go ahead and do that with soul and they could make bank it would be the water cooler movie of the week you know it, it'll be interesting to see if they do go that route i was hearing that there's rumblings that it will go to maybe the sort of the same route that Mulan went where, you know, it's a premium on Disney plus. I'd do it. I'd go ahead and buy it really quick. A uh, couple others. I did want to mention, these are ones that do have release dates. So I really like this idea that Amazon prime hooked up with bloom house, the horror. Yeah. Uh, production oh, I am company. familiar. Yes. So they're doing something called welcome to the bloom house this fall. And they're actually going to do eight horror oh, films. Yeah. Yeah, it's an anthology. And, yep. And the one I'm looking forward to most is called The Lie, which comes out October 6th. It stars Joey King and Peter Sarsgaard. And I think Sarsgaard is Joey King's father. And he's driving his daughter and her friend somewhere. They stop like in the woods, kind of odd place to, for whatever reason. He goes to do something and the, the two girls go into the woods to do something and only his daughter comes back. And I think then the, the family is trying to cover up what happened. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Does sound interesting. So that was the other one I was looking forward to. You mentioned Chicago 7. All right. Well, I guess that is our fall movie preview, such as it is in 2020. But I'm, I'm excited about all of these movies. Agree. If we missed the movie you're looking forward to the most, shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw, or you can always email us feedback at CinemaJaw.com. What we're going to do is take a quick break. And when we come back, wow, this is big. We have another review, this one of The Social Dilemma. And Matt, Tony Fitzpatrick is taking you on in Dream Movie Trivia. Stick with us. Continuing our month-long celebration of Robert Pattinson, we bring you this clip when Robert meets Charlie Hunnam's character in the underseen 2017 film, The Lost City of Z. A week. Why are you just presenting yourself now? I wanted to make sure you're up to the task, sir. Are you drunk, Mr. Costa? No. You could have fooled me. Well, well, I might have had a little. I've got a little condition. Let's see, I'm better skilled at rifle and pistols. And for bravery. It's very impressive. You have a family? No, no, at all. I see. So nothing to shed. I take it you do then. We are back on Cinema Jaw. Again, Tony Fitzpatrick, who can be seen in Dreaming Grand Avenue, is going to be taking Matt on in trivia. Before we get there and before we get to our review, we did throw one item into the jaw box. So let's open up that jaw box. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got a box. Uh, what's in the box? The question was this, Matt. Aaron Sorkin, as you mentioned, is directing the Chicago, the trial of the Chicago seven. And we wanted to know, is this his directorial debut? Obviously a uh, very famous screenwriter looked it up. He has directed one other film and that was 2017's Molly's game. This was with Jessica Chastain where she was running the high end poker game. Oh, wow. Sorkin directed that, huh? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I liked... wrote it and directed it. I liked that movie. It was pretty good. 
I agree. Uh, if you haven't seen Molly's Game, I do. I would recommend it as well. It just flew under the radar. It was one of those movies uh, that came out at the end of the year, as so many do, and some get a lot of traction, and, and that some one don't. just and that one just didn't. But I do recommend it, and sounds like you do as well. Yeah, we reviewed it on Cinema Jaw, did we not? We did. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, Go back and listen to that one, Jawheads. Yeah. So this will be Aaron Sorkin's second film directed. Before we close this jaw box, Matt, it one is, order of business. That's right, Ryan. It is Cinema Jaw Awareness Month. So speaking of going back and listening to old episodes, you should also tell a friend about the show, somebody who doesn't know. We're all sort of going through this crazy time together. And one of the things we can look to for a little bit of escape is movies. And you need to know what movies are worth your time. So you need to listen to Cinema Jaw. Tell somebody that. Tell them to put it in their phone. On your next Zoom meeting, when they say, what did you do this weekend? Say, I listen to Cinema Jaw. When they say, what's that? Tell them how to get it. Do it, Jawheads. Let's close this job. Ryan, what if I told you you were being watched or worse, manipulated? Your every move, purchase, look, desire, fetish, tracked, known, written, and used against you by the highest bidder. This is the reality that The Social Dilemma, a new documentary by Netflix, shows us. A social media landscape run amok, and AI algorithms set to tear apart the fabric of our civility and unleash our inner demons. When you go to Google and type in climate change is, you're going to see different results depending on where you live and the particular things that Google knows about your interests. That's not by accident, that's a design technique. What I want people to know is that everything they're doing online is being watched, is being tracked. Every single action you take is carefully monitored and recorded. A lot of people think Google's just a search box and Facebook's just a place to see what my friends are doing. What they don't realize is there's entire teams of engineers whose job is to use your psychology against you. I was the co-inventor of the Facebook like button. I was the president of Pinterest. Google. Twitter. Instagram. There were meaningful changes happening around the world because of these platforms. I think we were naive about the flip side of that coin. We get rewarded by parts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. A whole generation is more anxious, more depressed. I always felt like fundamentally it was a force for good. I don't know if I feel that way anymore. Right, it's trivially simple to write what is called machine learning programming. Heck, I've tinkered with it myself. It's what many video game AIs run on. It's also the technology that is at the center of things like Google Autocomplete, Facebook feeds, and Amazon recommendations. At its best, it can help save us precious seconds that add up over time and make for a better, more personalized experience online. But at its worst, it can add to the echo chamber effect of only showing us content that we agree with, ever edging up the salaciousness until one becomes a radicalized zealot that sees the other side as the devil. That is the central conceit in this documentary by director Jeff Orlowski. However, just like reality, the truth about these issues is not as simple as the movie makes it seem. Do I think these engines of commerce have run unchecked for far too long? and gain far too much power to influence us? Clearly, we are living through the proof of that, but I would suggest that it's not quite as simple or as apocalyptic as the social dilemma displays. Perhaps the doc is just one more bit of slanted propaganda. Perhaps, is that possible? Also, we need to discuss that this is not simply a talking heads doc. There's animation and even a plot helmed by actual dramatic actors who bring the story to life. Initially, I found this very jarring and far too dramatic recreation a la Unsolved Mysteries for my taste. But as the story went on, I got to say, I was hooked and I actually felt empathy for these characters. It's a little cheesy and I know it will turn off some, but I think it might have made this film a lot less dry. I, I, I'd say this is a check in the pro column. Also, it doesn't hurt that the talking heads that are in the film are all ex-Silicon Valley executives and high level ones at that who are clearly wrestling like a Dr. Frankenstein with the monster that they've created. 
right? I love a good documentary, especially a water cooler one like The Social Dilemma. I do applaud its direction in general, even if I think the specifics of its message are far too biased to be objective. What did you think? Did The Social Dilemma make you want to share it on Facebook or delete your account? <laughs> well, let me say this. I am in the group that was not a fan of that dramatic recreation you spoke of. Actually, I hated it. It was like forcing me to watch a bad after-school special. Oh, totally. As for the topics covered in the doc, fascinating. I do hate how dramatic these documentaries make things at the start. This drives me nuts. They ask a question, and then the person takes like a deep breath, and then they cut away. All right, enough of that. Cut to the meat. I was most interested in the part when they talked about how we live in a world with two truths. There is yeah. no more common ground anymore, and that's scary. This is a bloated documentary, but it is interesting. That's pretty much where I landed with it. You're right. The best thing about this is the truth, the two truths thing. Like, and, and this is, anybody can take, do this experiment. If you type into your Google search bar a sentence, whatever it is, like in this case in the film, it's global, or global climate change is, the autocomplete will show you terms based on your history. So if you're somebody who doesn't believe in climate change, it will start showing you words like fake, false, you know, blah, blah, blah. And if you're somebody who believes in it, it would, you know, say the, the worst things ever. Frightening stuff, frightening stuff. And that's where I think the movie shined, but where it fails is obviously we'll, we'll talk about the dramatic recreation stuff, but <laughs> yeah, not I, even it, getting to that yet. I think it fails because a lot of what it says is just too doom and gloom. It, it is doom and gloom. And I think when they get to that interesting part of the two truths, and, and you just described it really well of how, you know, you got one group of people that are only going to be seeing articles and reading and watching videos from a particular point of view and another group looking at the opposite, the effect that that's having is, is what's causing this great divide that we're seeing right now in the country and in the world. It's, it's nobody knows what to believe anymore. And if, if we're not talking about one truth and, and, and in fact, everybody has their own truth, then there's just no hope you say the documentary is doom and gloom, but I do think that in actuality it is doom and gloom also. It worries me that we can never really come out of that again unless we somehow, as they suggest in the documentary, just turn it off. But who are they kidding? We are not going to turn it off. I also don't think that that's the only solution. I think that it's, listen, Alphabet, the company that owns Google, can, can make changes to the auto-suggest feature. They can also turn down... Wait, 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 wait. One more second here. Somebody owns Google? Alphabet, yeah. Where have you been, Ryan? This, this happened in like 2016, 2015? Wow, okay, yeah. It beats me. I just know it as Google. Everybody just knows it as Google. But it, it, yeah, it's, it's almost a trivial fact that actually the parent company of Google is Alphabet. It really doesn't even matter. It's still Google. So let's just say Google. They can make adjustments to their suggestion engine. Facebook can adjust the feed to show somebody different points of view. These changes are healthy. They're not even hard. They're super trivially easy. And I don't even think it would cost them money in the long term. I don't think it would take people's attention away. They've made all these changes and put all these things in place to keep people's attention, to keep them on the platform to watch the next video, you, you scroll through the feed. And they talk about this. This is one of the things that I think that the dramatic recreation did explain pretty well, how they want you to scroll through the feed. And if you just stop at something, even if you don't click on it, they count that, they track that. But even if it was something you didn't agree with, it would still make you stop. So my point is, these things are easy to dial in the direction of the common good. And they should be, that should be regulated it's not doom and gloom. I think that the documentary got that wrong. The need for the dramatic recreation here was because if it wasn't for that, it really would be just a talking head documentary with these experts. Uh, and I'm using air quotes when I say experts, but people who have worked at various social media. Oh, outlets. no, these are, these are heavy hitters. Yeah, but they were heavy hitters at working at these companies. But I, I wanted like a philosophy on 
what exactly is happening to society the more we use these social media sites. And that's where I think they were lacking. Hey, they could tell us this is exactly what you know Instagram does and the way the search engine works or how YouTube controls what videos you watch. But it only went so long into the actual philosophy of exactly why it's tearing the country apart. And that, again, goes back to the, the two truths that we're, we're living in. But it only dealt with that for about 20 minutes of the entire movie. And that's what I wanted the whole movie to be. I agree. I agree. And the dramatic recreation, we've been dancing around this. When it first started, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to turn this movie off. Like, I, I don't know if I can stomach this. And I actually have a friend who we were talking about this did turn the movie off. He's like, oh, and I said, go ahead and finish watching it. It's worth it. I didn't like the dramatic recreation at first. It's actually not a dramatic recreation. We're just calling it that. I didn't like the the uh, the acted bits at first, but by the end of the movie, like I said, I think it, it kind of came around, but you all, the whole way through hated it, huh? I, I hated it, yeah. At first, I thought Amanda Peet was one of the actresses, so that kept me somewhat interested for about you know, five minutes, I kept saying, wait, is that Amanda Pete? Has she slipped that far down the A-list that she's in this dramatic recreation in a documentary? Well, it wasn't Amanda Pete. It was a, a lookalike, but uh, that kept me a little interested for a while. But near the end, I was like, geez, don't go to this anymore. You know? I thought it was handy to illustrate some of the points of the film. I didn't mind it by the end. The beginning of it, though, I was like, ugh, mm. it was really treacle and as saccharine like artificial i didn't like it you got a movie poster quote for us we think you will like this movie i went with uh hashtag must see hashtag amazing hashtag hashtag yeah that, that's pretty fitting how many <laughs> how many jaws are you giving this thing two jaws this is a two jaw movie dude we gotta stop agreeing so much <laughs> i'm at two jaws as well and i love a good doc i love technology thought i was gonna like this one more hmm the Social Dilemma is streaming on Netflix. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw or an email, feedback at CinemaJaw.com. I already hear the music, Matt, and that can only mean one thing. It's time to play some trivia. Tony Fitzpatrick is back, and as I mentioned, in honor of Dreaming Grand Avenue, we are playing Dream Movie Trivia. It works like this. Tony, you're our guest you get to choose if you want to go first. Let Matt go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on any questions, you do get one rescue. And Tony, I think you should go first. Kevin Costner plays catch with his dad in a cornfield in this field of dreams. There we go. <laughs> Got to get him on the board, exactly. One to nothing. All Matt, right. qu question two to you. Freddie from Nightmare on Elm Street who attacks in your dreams, who played Freddy Krueger? Robert England. Yes. Robert England. Yes. That's easy. Jackie Earl Haley was the guy in the remakes, by the way. That is good. Yeah. That is good. Question three. By the way, who was, also, who was also great in uh, the Watchmen movie. He was, yeah. yeah. Goes all the way yeah, back Earl to Hale. Bad News he, Bears. He made the movie about him playing Rorschach, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No doubt. Question three, back over to Tony. Cheech and Chong starred in this 1981 comedy that had the tagline, it rhymes with ice creams. Um, oh, man. Not up in smoke. Uh, We're playing dream movie trivia. I know. I'm, try I'm trying to think. I've seen every Cheech and Chong movie. <laughs> well, so that's why you can't remember, Tony. <laughs> They were, they were kind of my gurus in high school, you know. It's like, uh, yeah. I mean, me and my friends kind of kept Colombian business, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> Cheech and Chong, it rhymes with ice creams. Sweet dreams? Or? We'll give it to them. Nice dreams. Nice dreams. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Close enough. Movie. Close enough. Two to one. Not the best Cheech and Chong movie, by the way. <laughs> They're no. all pretty good. Two to They're one, great, Tony. The ones with Star, uh, Sergeant Stenko are the best. Up in Smoke is my favorite. Yeah. Question four over to Matt K. Matt, Open Your Eyes remake Vanilla Sky starred Tom Cruise and this actress who played Sophia, who he falls in love with at a party. Oh, man. Um, oh, the one who was married to uh, Javier Bardem now. I, 
Penelope Cruz. I, I was going to guess. To Tony. Yeah, I was going to guess uh, Cameron Diaz anyway. So yeah, it, it well, is Penelope Cruz. Is the nut who drives him off the bridge. Remember? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Three to one, Tony. Question five is over to him. Tony, eight years after Dazed and Confused, this director gave us wa Waking Life that asked the question: Are we sleepwalking through our waking state or wake walking through our dreams? Name the director. Of waking that starred Keanu Reeves. Yes. <laughs> See? You think but you're missing kids here? <laughs> four to one, four to one, Tony. Question six over to Matt K. Matt, Dream Girls, the movie, ended up winning two Oscars. One was for sound mixing, and the other was for this actress who won for a supporting role. Name the actress Jennifer Hudson, right? There you go. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Four to two, Tony still you know, winning. The only one one for that was Eddie Murphy. I yeah. agree. It was magnificent in Dream Girls. Totally yep. agree. Tony, question seven over to you. Just before this actor starred as Batman, he starred in the 1989 movie The Dream Team. Name the actor. Oh, uh, Christian Bale. Mm. Incorrect. Incorrect. No. Matt, you got a chance for a steal. I love, I love that deal. movie. That's um, that was Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good Christopher Lloyd's in it. It's it's yeah. actually really yeah. funny. I, I should have known that, man. Last question of the game. Eight question. Over to Matt. Matt Morgan Freeman has appeared in two films based on Stephen King stories. One of them, Shawshank Redemption, and the other was this 1993 film about four friends encountering parasitic aliens. Wait, who? Who was the actor? Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Parasitic aliens. Based on a Stephen King story. Tommyknockers. That is incorrect. Any guess for you, Tony? You won this one four to no, three. No, and it's weird because I've read every Stephen King book. Yeah, me too. Dreamcatcher, Dreamcatcher. Oh, wow. with Aaron Schultz. I remember that movie. There you go. I don't. How did I screw that up, man? It, it, if it came down to a tie, we call it a jawbreaker, Tony. This question would have been to Matt. Matt, what's the better courtroom movie that Tony Fitzpatrick has appeared in, Primal Fear or Philadelphia? Oh, man. I'm a Primal They're Fear guy. Pretty good. Yeah. I'd give that one to you. I like Primal Fear a lot. Oh, Philadelphia is close to my heart as well. Yep. Yeah, you know, I mean, Philadelphia, I got a scene with uh, Denzel. So, I mean, I got to give it. And Philadelphia was also made by my dear friend, the guy responsible for me having a career, Jonathan Demi. You know, I mean, he was one of my oldest friends. And uh, I miss him every single day. Good guy. No you guys didn't like him. That was a guy who knew his way around driving movies. Well, Tony, he this is very well working for Roger Corman. Really? Yeah, his first few movies were Angels as Hard as They Come, Caged Heat. Hell, he made a woman's prison movie. You know who else started with uh, Corman was, um, oh my God, Avatar. Help me, Ryan. I'm blanking. James Cameron. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Damn near everybody started with him. You know, for, for somebody who's known for schlock, he, he really launched some of the best filmmakers around. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he did it by saying, you know what? I got 200 grand. Go make me a movie. Don't ask me for any more money. And what Jonathan told me was that I, I learned an economy of elements. I learned how to stretch my money and, uh, you know, get the best for what I had. Yeah. Learn by doing. Absolutely. Well, Tony, this has been a pleasure getting a chance to talk to you. And again, the name of the movie, Dreaming Grand Avenue. We loved it here on Cinema Job. You guys, thanks so much for having me, man. Thanks for thinking of me. I'm very grateful. And After Tony, this mess is, uh, is all over, Tony, we, we got to have you in the studio sometime. Absolutely. Where, where are you guys at? Are you in the city here? Yeah, yeah. I'm in Rogers Park and, and Ryan's in Wicker Park. Yep. Oh, God, I'm in East Humboldt Park. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah, let's get a mix of tacos and have some fun. Yeah, and go White Sox, Tony. Go White hey, Sox. Man, they're gonna Perfect. do it, man. Oh boy, that was great talking to Tony. Dude, a, a true gentleman. Uh, that was a real treat, and can't wait to get that guy in the studio. 
I agree. Brings us to the end of a great jaw. We also got to thank our sponsors, Matt. Of course we do, Ryan. We got to say thanks to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get great sponsors like Overcast have been a sponsor for us for a very long time and we appreciate it. If you would like to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so is by leaving us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And while your thumb is on your phone screen, tap subscribe. It really doesn't take much and it helps us out tremendously. Should note Amazon Music, the service Amazon Music now has podcasts and I used my Amazon Alexa to say, Alexa, play the latest episode of Cinema Jaw. And she did it, Matt. That is tremendous. I remember the early days, I would try to get her to play it and she would uh, think I was saying Cinnamon Jar or something like that. So (laughs) great to hear that she finally wised up to our show. Absolutely. Until next week, I'm Brian, the movie guy. I'm Matt Kay. And keep on jawing about about the movies. movies.